I think we already had the chance to see some interesting cross-fertilization today between the different talks, and I think that is a testimony to the, uh, to the potential of this kind of network that, that uh, Rocher has set up. Um, I see some connection between Homu's presentation and Monica's presentation today um, about where Monica showed how the leveraging of the banks have changed with time, and this is um, also something you approach from a point of view of, of, of the theory. Um, I also see some connection between uh, Calvo's <laughs> uh, talk today and what I'm going to talk about today, um, namely about uh, individual investment behavior. Uh, you're approaching it from the point of view of data, as Monica did. I'm approaching the issue from the point of view of, of theory, um, and maybe also some relation between my talk and what uh, Wagner did this morning. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrongly. Um, and certainly, of course, uh, I'm working in the rational belief tradition, so uh, it's no surprise that there's connection with Mordecai's work. Uh, today, I'm going to address something which, um, in a way, I think uh, is being the, the elephant in the room. Um, because in the context of this network, I think it's fair to say that we are, and we're certainly focusing on, on um, diverse expectations, but we're also mostly trying to retain the assumption of rationality. So we're not approaching diverse expectations from the point of view of behavioral uh, economics as far as I can read from the program and certainly as far as I can read from, from today's presentations. That's my interpretation, at least. What is the elephant in the room? Uh, the elephant in the room is um, welfare implications of what we are doing. What are the welfare implications of um, diverse beliefs? Uh, and let me present the issue as I see it by in the tradition of the Danes, the tribe I'm belonging to, a fairy tale. And here we have a bad king, and he only has one daughter. And we had the good king, which is our, is going to be our benevolent dictator today. He has three sons, names, wit, looks, and charm. Uh, so this is how they think about themselves. And the, fir the, the fourth, uh, the, sorry, uh, this, the last actor in this drama is the dragon in the moth. Uh, the bad king has announced that his daughter is going to be married away to any suitable suitor next Sunday, and anyone, she would choose from anyone that shows up next Sunday. There are only those three suitable suitors, and they all believe with, that if they are allowed to go, they for sure will be be, be chosen, they have different ideas about the uh, preferences of um, uh, the princess. I, I let you fill out the, 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 the rest of the story. Uh, now, if the good king is Parisian, he should let all of them go. That is the only Pareto optimal solution in this setup. So this is what Pareto optimality tells us. Why is that? Well, from the point of view of, think about it, wit is allowed to go, and now we ask, will it uh, be bad for wit if looks is also allowed to go? No, because wit is sure to win. So he doesn't care whether looks go or not, and he doesn't care about what's going to happen to looks, I should add to that. So, okay, I forgot to tell you, I think you maybe already, that those who are turned down will be fed to the dragon in the moth. So this is the game we're talking about. So, uh, wit doesn't mind that looks and charm are allowed to go, and for those two, obviously, this involves a Pareto improvement. So, uh, reasoning along those lines, I conclude that the only Pareto optimal decision here is to let all of the three princes go, knowing for sure that two of them will end up in the moth, and one of them will end up with the princess. 
So, um, of course, one reaction, this is about, this is normative, discussion about normative economics, one reaction to this story is, okay, let all of them go. Nonetheless, I think many of us have some problems with that. There's a level of, uh, at the level of society, there is a, a um, issue of rationality. The problem is that the expectation of these guys do not add up in a certain sense, right? The, the, if you add the expected return for these three guys, we get three princesses, but they're only one princess. So we are talking about a kind of bubble here, a rational bubble, because we cannot tell any of these guys that they're wrong. They could perfectly well be, each of them could perfectly well be right. It's not an issue about lack of rationality here. It's an issue about inconsistency at the level of society. Now, if you uh, use another welfare criterion, namely so-called exposed, sorry, not exposed, yeah, exposed utility, if you maximize exposed utility, or use the exposed welfare criterion, you should let exactly one of them go. Which one? That's not something that we can decide. And that, of course, is, of course, an issue here. But um, that at least implies a rational decision at the level of society. So this is going to be uh, my starting point for talking about a very specific issue. And I chose uh, Social Security, and I chose to talk about a specific issue because I think it's important to, as soon as we're done with the fairy tales, to link up to something which has policy relevance. So the main ingredients of my talk today is, and I'm going to go quickly over these things, uh, is exposed welfare optimality. As, as opposed to Pareto optimality, rational beliefs, and rational overconfidence. And then I'll, after briefly talking about these um, general principles and ideas, I will go back to the social security example and argue that we can uh, rationalize social security Named, that is forced savings by individuals without having to uh, assume or, or that agents are irrational, that is, without having to assume a position of paternalism. By the way, if you have any questions as we go along, I'll be very happy to take those, also because this is um, also my chance to get feedback from people, so please interrupt me. <laughs> the princess's preferences are unknown, right? <laughs> well, that's going to be the next chapter. <laughs> uh, so, the easiest way to present Pareto optimality in the context of what I'm doing is as a weighted, possibly unweighted sum of subjectively expected utility. But here we have individual um, expectations, that's the EJ. So each agent J has its own expectations about what's going to happen in the future, what would be the consequences of actions and so on. Ex post welfare optimality, and that concept um, original, originates with Hammond, uh, who uh, in a certain sense relies on work by Ross Starr, um, and who was further inspired by other people. Uh, export welfare optimality allows for the individual preferences to be as uh, individual, but for the expectation to be at the level of society. Uh, I don't know if exposed welfare optimality is a, ex the whole issue of exposed, uh, the whole notion of exposed is the best, but I basically took that from the literature. So. I'll leave it there. So, of course, we do not, this is the decision maker, the, this uh, benevolent dictator or whatever we want to think of him being. Uh, the issue is, of course, what should this be? That is the burning issue that that literature was mute on. Uh, and I think that 
for me at least, uh, well, I started this without knowing about this literature, uh, but when I was told about this literature by, by Hammond, I could also see why it kind of died out in the 60s, and it happened to be, they happened to, 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 to sail into the perfect storm of the rational expectations revolution. Um, it died off because there was nothing to say about what this should be. And I think with the rational expectation, sorry, rational belief literature, we have at least a, one proposal for what this should be. And this I'll get back to. Uh, so rational belief with Mordecai. Um, and I think I will uh, go over this fairly quickly. You heard about it today. But I will go over it in terms of a very simple example of toin, uh, sorry, coin tosses where we have a stochastic sequence of realizations uh, of heads or tail. Um, I'm kind of getting, can you hear me also when I talk like this? I don't know. Uh, so we have an empirical distribution. That is what we mean by stability. We mean that there is an empirical distribution. The observation is that the coin is IID with probability two-thirds of heads, one-third of tails. That is the stationary distribution that Mordecai called M today. I should, it's, P is not stationary. But the infinite product of P bar is what Mordecai called M today. So it cannot be more simple than this if you want to explain uh, rational beliefs. So what does it mean? It means that the limit frequency of observation of heads is two-thirds. This empirical distribution is known, it's common knowledge, it's known by everyone. There's no asymmetric information in our story. Not that it, there couldn't be, but we don't need it. So, I think about rational belief as describing possible rational models that agents could have. A rational model is a model that is consistent with the common, no, commonly known empirical distribution and of course, one rational model is the rational expectation model, which says, says that the true distribution, which we do not know, is equal to the empirical distribution, which we do know. That's a hypothesis. There's no way to confirm it or reject it. It's consistent with what we observe. That's all we can say. Another rational model is to believe that the world is non-stationary. And one example would be that there are actually two coins in play. In our simple example, half of the times, the coin is five, five six probability of heads. The other half of the times is three, six. And the rationality condition, what Mordecai now has called rationalizability, is that on average, if you play these coins, and they have to be distributed in a very unsystematic way. Don't think about odd, even dates. That's not going to work. That's going to be some correlation showing up in data. But if they are distributed in a very random way, then the empirical distribution they will generate will exactly be the one that is known by everyone. So this is another rational model. This is an example of an SIDS, non-stationary rational belief, as, as, as defined by me some, some, some time back. Uh, and you can think about this sequence of, of this is a deterministic sequence of one period beliefs as being a typical realization of an IID equal probability drawn from this set of probabilities P0 and P1 that you have up here. You can also think about this sequence as being represented by a dyadic expansion of the number I in this interval 0 to 1. So think about what I'm going to do in this model is I'm assuming that for each number i in this interval, there is, a, there is an agent i who is in this interval. And he has a belief, which is this dyad dyadic expansion. So he gets this belief. So everyone has a different belief. However, the distribution of the one period beliefs it's going to be the same at all dates. So at all dates, it's going to be the same number of people having this belief and having this belief. And um, the fact that we get something which is quite different from the rational expectation case 
is in a way a, a refutation of what Muth said according to Wagner in his 1961 paper that if beliefs are sufficiently dispersed around the, the mean, so to speak, there should be no real consequences. This is not correct in our world. On the other hand, the Muth idea that and that was his original proposal, that people do not have the same expectation, but they have expectations which are in a certain sense distributed around the truth that is completely in accordance with rational beliefs. In that sense, the rational belief theory is more rational expectation than what became rational expectation, in fact. Muth only suggested the assumption of homogeneous beliefs as a shortcut to getting a solution to his model. That shortcut became the rule, the law of rational expectations. If you read his 61 paper, you will see that it was only a way of solving the cobweb model in a simple way. So I think that is an interesting, I mean, historically interesting observation. Rational overconfidence is a concept I have presented in another paper. The idea is that um, we observe people having beliefs which... Are you saying in the same example, the same previous case? One more time. So that previous example is a draw from... Yes, one. yes. We're staying in that coin toss example throughout the presentation. So this sequence, this non-stationary sequence uh, of belief, so this non-stationary belief is rational, but it's more precise in the sense that it has a smaller quote-unquote support than the stationary belief where you believe that the world is the same at every point in time. So you believe that sometimes there's a high probability of heads, sometimes there's a lower probability of heads. In that sense, your prediction is more precise. So that gives rise to, that is a rationally confident belief. If someone tells me this is his belief, I can tell you are confident in the sense that you think that you are quite able to predict the future, I cannot say that this person is ir irrational. However, if I have a group of people in front of me and each of them has rationally confident beliefs which are different, I would say there must be rational overconfidence present because at most one of these people has the right belief. All the others must be wrong. So each of them has a rationally confident belief and almost all of them is wrong. That's what I can conclude from this observation. So I call it rational overconfidence. I cannot point out who is right, who is wrong, but I can say that as a group, these people are not all correct. Uh, and I should say that uh, I use the, the concept of rationality with some hesitation because I think it's a little bit misplaced in the context of expectations. It's really not possible to say about a belief about the future, no matter what the uh, behavioral economists say, that such a belief is irrational. But nonetheless, I think that was also Mordecai's um, uh, attitude, but he chose rational belief as to, to be in the same in the same logic as rational expectations. Question? So at the point of the of taking the future, and uh, suppose that there is a uh, unique stationary nature. Yes. So we know about it. Yes. They can all concentrate on the stationary nature. If they all choose the stationary measure, uh -huh. then there's no confident belief, and, and there's no rational overconf uh, overconfidence because I cannot say that these people are wrong, right? So they're only rational overconfident if they are heterogeneous beliefs. There's only rational over, overconfident when there are heterogeneous beliefs. It, yes, so I'm not excluding that there is, we could have met an economy where there, it's impossible to state that there is rational overconfidence. But if beliefs are heterogeneous, I defined that case as being the case of rational overconfidence. So these two agents who are rational confident, they are going to agree with the stationary nature. 
Yes. Yes. They agree on that. They have rational belief. Yes. They agree that this is the stationary measure. They don't agree that this is the truth. They have, each of them has different beliefs of what is the truth. Both of these beliefs generate the stationary measure. So both of these beliefs are consistent with what they agree of about, namely, the empirical um, performance of the economy. Okay. So, uh, so uh, uh, whether you should call beliefs rational or not, that's, that's something you could certainly mm, discuss. Uh, I, I mean, whether, you, or in other words, whether you should call them irrational or not is certainly something you can discuss or not. Um, I have 15 minutes more, is that correct? Uh, yeah, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, so I will tr drop um, the literature. Um, I always want to say that there are a few, there's a politic, uh, I mean, political explanation of social security. There are some classic, classical explanations. There are some explanations using non-classical rationality framework. And there are, for the most part, Explanation using bounded rationality. Agents are wrong uh, in one way or the other. And uh, one, of course, very prominent example is time inconsistency, hyperbolic preferences. Uh, now, this model is as simple as it can be. I have a continuum of agents. Uh, the only stochastic variable in this economy is their second period uh, wealth, um, and that is common to all in the economy. It can be high or low. There are one period beliefs as before, P0, P1. The distribution at any period in time is constant. So Q has used P1, P, sorry, P0 to predict the wealth next period, one minus Q, the fraction of one minus Q uses, P1 to predict the wealth, the common wealth level of society next period. The idea is, roughly speaking, that if uh, some people may think that the we're going to have good times next time, other people think that's going to be less good times, that will influence their savings behavior. But be beyond that, there's absolutely no, I mean, there's no real um, economic model here because there's no interaction these people make their savings decision independently. There's no equilibrium price, nothing of what you used to see. There's no negative externality like in the story of the, 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 the king's dilemma. Um, the second part of this paper, which I don't have time to cover, will actually have an equilibrium price. They will discuss another aspect. Yes, yeah, they're just... This just stores away the corn, and next year they use it. Uh, so in that sense, I make things very difficult for myself, and I make it a very uh, uh, sharp what I'm talking about, what I'm doing here. So this guy is having, uh, so remember there's a continuum of agents. If you have belief PK about next period, you solve this very simple savings problem. Um, so, so you have S times R, R is the kind of interest rate, uh, exogenous. And your solution depends only on your belief. If you use the stationary belief, there's a solution S bar, else it's SK for K equal to one to two. So here we solve the same problem, just replacing these beliefs, this belief with this one here. So the, I, propose that the government realistically can impose a lower bound on saving, force people to save up, but they cannot impose an upper bound on savings. Some people here will be saving up too little, some people saving up too much, if you use the stationary measure as criterion, which of course you cannot do um, without further uh, justification. So, uh, as in the social security, in reality, people are forced to save up something, but they're not forced to consume. So if this is the case, this is gonna be a new problem of the agents if they have a lower bound, S star, 
and this will give rise to the solution max s star and s k. Uh, so only the lower bound will be binding for these agents. And now I will calculate uh, welfare in a certain sense from this. So I will calculate welfare in a very particular and certainly not unproblematic unprom way, but, um, and that is in a way um, uh, an open issue about how to, to, to improve or how better to argue about that, maybe how to, to, to formalize these calculations using axioms. First, I will look at the average over time sum unweighted over all these individuals, realized utility. So this is the, is what they will actually have. This is possible to do because we are in a rational, rational beliefs world. So you see I take the limit as one divided by t, as t going to infinity of the sum of t going from one to t, capital T, so this is the time, and then I take the sum over the individuals because I multiply Q on those, that utility, um, uh, S, is this a, I think this is, yeah. So uh, this is the fraction of agents who will use P zero, so they will save up, uh, save up S zero, and this is this max S star S zero. So this is the, utility of the first part of the population, those Q who use P0, and this is the, the other fraction, those who use P1. But it's the realized utility. How can you calculate a realized utility in this world? You can do that because we're living in a world where the sequence is stable. So people know, everyone knows, what will be the realized utility in this society over time. The realized average over time sum of unweighted sum over individuals. So basically the average over all individuals from t equal to one to infinity. This is possible, I repeat, because we know that this sequence of uh, second period endowments is stable, or we know, we assume it in this model. Uh, and Monakai explained why this kind of assumption can be defended this morning. What is the result? It's almost surely using the true unknown distribution. We don't know what it is, but we know that no matter what it is, it's almost surely equal to this expression here, where I use the stationary measure or the stationary one period probability to calculate the average. This will be the realized average utility for this society, no matter what the true measure is. If this is so, what is then the optimal policy of the government? It's to set S star equal to S bar. In that case, uh, for instance, if this is the guys who wants to save up too little, these guys will be forced to save up S bar. The other ones will be saving up too much because this constraint will not be binding. But that is just a consequence of the limitation of the policy. Here's another way to calculate the resulting welfare of any policy S star. I take the average over time of the expected unweighted sum of individual use utility using an expectation ET based on any rational belief about this sequence of endowments. So here I take expectations and I look at the average and because of rationality of belief, I end up with exactly the same as before. Again, this is uh, this P bar J. I know this may look a little bit like sort of pulling rabbits out of the hat, but this is really the underlying, the outcome of the underlying assumption that we live in a world where everyone has rational beliefs, where everyone knows the stationary distribution of this economy. So everyone agrees on that this will be the resulting 
average utility. Just like before, when I looked at the realized utility, everyone agrees that this will be the resulting utility for society. And finally, I can use the simply the stationary measure to take expectations. And again, I get. I didn't. Didn't I say that? Here. Uh, well, um, yes and no. In um, depends on if it doesn't go to infinity, you have to impose further assumptions about the distribution over time. Uh, if the distribution is in this context, it's not important. Uh, I mean, it, you just have to have large T's. Then you'll get closer and closer to this. Of course, you'll not never get there, right? So, in 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 this context of just two. SIDS belief, it's not essential. Uh, and then I use this station expectation to take uh, at any point in time the expected return. And this is, here I do not need to take an average over time. I still take an unweighted average over all agents. Of, I get the same result. So all three approaches give me the same uh, the same object to be maximized, and uh, again, the same optimal policy, which is to set S star equal to S bar. So, what does that mean? Uh, it means that everyone in this economy, considered as a dynasty, so I think about a, a whole generation of agents where, so I mean, a rational belief is an intimate sequence of one period beliefs. I have people in this model who only live for two periods. But so I think about a dynasty as having holding and rational belief. Everyone in this economy is subjectively worse off from this policy. But this policy is not a Pareto improvement. On the contrary, it makes everyone worse off. It forces people to f save up when they don't want to. Um, Nonetheless, everyone agrees that on average, everyone is better off. The average improvement is objective. So this is the paradox, maybe going back to the fairy tale. If you think about the king saying, only one of you can go, everyone will be unhappy about that decision. But everyone will also agree that this is the best for society. I think about many cases where we don't want to be restricted in our behavior, but we agree that restricting the behavior of people in general is uh, uh, improving. And if we allow for a, an action of symmetry, we should maybe agree that we are willing to give up some of our own welfare in return for increasing the overall welfare of society. So in my last slide, I can see Roger is waiting to step in. Um, and, well, I have more slides, but I will not, you can see those on the, on the, on the website. So, here the issue is individual rationality versus ra rationality of society. Uh, you can think about this policy principle being formulated and accepted behind a veil of ignorance where we do not know which position we will occupy in particular circumstances. We do not know whether we will be optimistic or pessimistic at a particular point in time. We just know that, that um, there will be instances, or we assume that we, we institute this policy in, ex in the expectation that there will be instances where they will be useful to impose rational behavior, whether that be wearing hard hats on the building sites, safety belts in the car, using social security, so on and so forth, which we don't think should be imposed on us, but we agree that this will be good for society. You can also think about an interim symmetry, the sense that no one is better informed uh, than anyone else. We just have different beliefs. And again, the the, 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 the intervention, this social security, is not based on the idea that someone 
The big brother knows more than we do about the truth. So we, I would say we do not have paternalism in this case. But we also do not have uh, unstricted individual behavior. So I would say that there's an un absence of libertarianism in this policy. And I suggest a label for it that is bar, this social security in my simple model is non-paternalistic and non-libertarian. Thank you.